Hello, and welcome to another episode of Neon Kev. In this episode, we will tear down and attempt to repair this Keysight U8903A audio analyzer. The U8903A is a DSP-based audio measurement and generation system. It can analyze frequencies from 10 Hz to 100 kHz on two channels with an AC accuracy of plus or minus 1%, and generate frequencies from 5 Hz to 80 kHz on two separate generator channels. It has 24-bit resolution, different input coupling and impedances for a variety of balanced and unbalanced audio signals, and many different functions in software including standard and user-defined digital filters. This particular instrument is reported to have an issue with the analyzer section. When I originally bought this instrument, I knew that it had some front panel damage. The only way to get a new front panel was to send the instrument to Keysight. I sent the unit to Keysight and they replaced the front panel. They also performed a verification at the factory and that is when the analyzer errors were discovered. Let's look at the measurement report to see where this instrument failed. Okay, so now we've got our measurement report here. You can see this is the model serial number instrument that we're looking at. And as we scroll down, let's go to the summary here. And we can see that all the failures actually correspond to the input tests. The output tests, which are for the generator, all passed. So let's take a look at some of the details where we see the failed tests. So here are some example failures. We can see that we have the test condition, the boundary conditions, and then the actual measured values from the instrument. And it looks like the measurement results are in fact erroneous. So it's not like we're out of tolerance, it's just that we're not even getting a legitimate measurement from the instrument, which makes sense given based on what we've observed uh, in our testing as well. See all these values, you know, we're in tens of millidBs in terms of, you know, the boundaries and then the actual measured value is insane. It's, you know, 700. This is obviously not a real number. So, yep, it looks like the problems we're seeing in our testing correspond to what we see on the measurement report now. So let's go back to the instrument and we'll strategize about how we can repair this possibly. All right, so here's our measurement setup so we can do some basic testing on the analyzer input channels. I have the U8903A set up to measure DC voltage on audio analyzer one and audio analyzer two channels. And I have the DC voltage coming from my power supply over there through this coax cable. I'm just using the coax to pass DC to the instrument and this DMN as well. So we have the coax coming in, splitting and going into analyzer channels one and two. And we're also tapping off of that line. And we have this uh, handheld DMM here just as a uh, verification to show exactly what volt DC voltage we have across all these uh, cables here. So what I'm going to do is turn the voltage up on the power supply. And we should be able to see both the displayed voltage on the instrument and the DMM. And we can see if the errors reported in the measurement report line up with what we measure here on the bench. All right, so now let's go ahead and apply DC voltage to the instrument and see if we can reproduce some of the problems we were seeing in the measurement report. So I'm going to start at one volt and work my way up. And according to the measurement report, there was an error between the 1.6 to 3.2 volt ranges. So I'm expecting to see an error on the reading of the instrument as we go up. So I'm going to turn my power supply on right now, and we're at 1 volt. Everything appears to be correct. So let's go up 100 millivolts at a time and see if we see an error anywhere. And we can see right there, as soon as we hit 2 volts, we have an erroneous reading on the instrument. So you can see that the first error that we've noticed here is between the 1.9 to 2.0 volt crossing here. As we hit two volts, the instrument completely loses its ability to read that. Now, as we keep going up in voltage, we actually, uh, as we cross certain bands and ranges, it appears that the error is somewhat intermittent. If I keep going up, you can see that the, the reading comes back and it gets lost. It's 
something's definitely wrong here. We keep going up in voltage. Now the measurement's stabilized, but I bet if we keep going up exactly what we saw before, it's going to keep running into that problem at different ranges. Let's go up uh, one volt at a time, go a little faster here. Yep, 11 volts, 12 volts, 13, 14, 15. You see that the error comes and goes. Now, one other thing I noticed was that this error would only present itself um, in the high bandwidth setting. So the U8903A has two different uh, channel input bandwidth settings for the analyzer. There's a low bandwidth setting and a high bandwidth setting. The low bandwidth setting is for measuring signals under uh, 30 kilohertz, and it's advantageous to change to low bandwidth if you're in that lower frequency range because it gives you better uh, dynamic range and noise performance of the instrument itself. So if we change to low bandwidth, suddenly our voltage reading is much more stabilized. You can still see the error is somewhat intermittent, but it certainly isn't as far out of range as it was when we go back to the high bandwidth setting, where the instrument completely loses its ability to read. So, and you can, as you can hear, um, there is some range switching or path switching when it changed from low bandwidth to high bandwidth. So I definitely believe there's something wrong with the high bandwidth path in this instrument, and that is what is causing the errors we're seeing in the measurement report. All right, so now we've got the cover popped off, and we can take a closer look at the inside of this instrument. I'll take some high resolution close up photos and we can try to work through it logically and see what's going on. Let's take a closer look at the U8903A to understand how it works at a hardware level. We have our front panel connectors here. As you can see, we have both XLR and BNC connectors on the front panel that terminate into each channel. Each channel has two connectors. This is a four channel instrument, two of which are generator channels and two of which are analyzer channels. These top two channels here are the generator channels and these bottom two channels here are the analyzer channels. Taking a closer look at the generator and analyzer channels from the top, we can see a few things that sort of make sense here. On our generator channels, we have a bunch of relays and op amps, of course, which we expect when a signal is generated, we would have to condition it and then amplify it within the range of the output. So whatever the dynamic range of our output needs to be, we have all of our range switching here. Now I didn't peel these cans back, so I'm, I'm not quite sure what is underneath these shielded cans. It could be more amplification, um, but you know, needless to say, this is an audio frequency generator, right? And we have two independent isolated channels and you can see the cutouts in the copper between all these channels. These two bottom channels are the audio analyzer channels. So these are inputs. We have signals coming in and then those must be divided and range switched and amplified accordingly and buffered before they get to our ADCs at the back here. So the signal comes in, it goes through all these relays or whichever relays are switched in circuit, depending on what range the instrument's on. So you're dividing and conditioning the final signal so that it's within the, the analog dynamic range of the analog to digital converters themselves. So we have some op amps here buffering the ADC inputs. And then we have our two ADCs. These are both analog devices, AD7763s. We'll take a closer look at the data sheet for that, but it is a commercial off the shelf part. And then we have our one of our DSP processors right here. It's another analog devices part, ADSP 21369. And then for our DSP processor, we have some RAM and some flash. And this is just a flipped view of the board. So again, we have our two generator channels on top. You can see clearly the isolation cutouts and then we have our two analyzer channels on the bottom. And this is just a close up of the back end of the channel. And this is the area that I'm going to focus on. 
because this is where our analyzer channel, where the actual analog to digital conversion happens. I suspect that there isn't a problem with the signal when it gets to the actual analog to digital converter, but there's something happening when it's becoming digital to give us that crazy, erroneous, terrible reading that we're seeing on the front panel. So let's take a closer look at the actual signals that we're seeing here when we apply DC input and go from there. All right, so let's take a look at our measurement setup and see exactly how I'm going to begin debugging this instrument to detect the errors that we noticed previously. So I have two differential probes right now, and I'm going to apply an input signal to the instrument. So you can see I've got my SMB to SMA connector and an SMAT, which is going in two different directions. And I'm just applying DC signals to the instrument right now. So I'm using the coax just for DC transmission to the input of the instrument. We are connected to the unbalanced connector on channel two, which is this SMB on the board. We're gonna go through the input section and the second differential probe that I have is connected across the differential input of the ADC on channel two. So what I want to measure is the buffered input signal coming in from our DC source. Then you have all these relays which are going to be responsible for range switching and op amps, which are responsible for amplification after the range switching. And finally, those go into the ADC, which is where the analog to digital conversion happens. So I want to see if there's any problem with the analog input coming from the input connector up to the ADC. Do we see any discontinuities or anything that would lead us to believe that there's a problem with how the analog signal is being conditioned before it is actually digitized? So in case you're curious, our DC voltage source is the B2902A source measure unit, and we're going to sweep from zero to 100 volts across the unbalanced input into the U8903A audio analyzer, which has a DC measurement range up to 140 volts. So we should be able to see a number of the ranges being switched and what that looks like at the ADC itself. Okay, so here's our oscilloscope, and we're going to be measuring the outputs from those two differential probes, channel one, is the DC input to the instrument, and then channel two is the differential voltage across the ADC input. Our time mode is in roll right now, so what I'll go ahead and do is start the sweep uh, from our DC source, and we can see as it increases from zero to 100 volts, what's happening with the ADC differential voltage input. It should switch ranges to keep it within the analog dynamic range of the actual ADC itself. So here we go. All right, and that was our sweep to 100 volts. You can see the DC source resets at the end. So we can see a nice linear ramp to 100 volts on channel one, and then channel two, you can see how the range switching is handled in this instrument in order to keep the analog input voltage to the ADC within its dynamic range. Uh, the ADC has a voltage reference of roughly four volts, and if we take a look in the data sheet, that specifies the input dynamic range at the ADC itself. All right, so now let's look at the reading on the actual audio analyzer while we do that zero to 100 volt sweep as well. You can see we have both audio analyzer channels on, but we only have the input signal going to channel two, which is highlighted. So let's run our sweep again and see what the voltage DC reading looks like during the sweep. So we've begun. You can see some of the erroneous terravolt readings popping up intermittently. However, it does look like the measurement is somewhat accurate. You can see where we are we're getting close to 100 volts now at the input. And that's the end of the sweep. And one other thing I'd like to try is to do the same test, but on the high measurement bandwidth setting. So let's run that test as well. Same input sweep. 
Now we can see the erroneous terravolt readings are sticking around throughout much more of the range here. And it looks like on the high range, it's almost impossible to get a good reading. Now we're getting some readings back here. And that's the end of the sweep. So we can see that there are more issues on the high bandwidth setting as opposed to low bandwidth setting. And my suspicion at this point, based on measuring the input voltage against the differential input voltage at the ADC, is that there's not an issue with the signal path between the input of the instrument and the input of the ADC itself. I believe there might be a digital problem happening after or at the ADCs. So I've gone ahead and ordered two new ADCs from DigiKey, and let's try transplanting them onto this motherboard and see if that makes a difference at all in the measurement results. I just wanted to show a little bit of the rework setup here. So we've got our motherboard supported by these clamping standoffs. I have a small preheater underneath the board, and you can see I put some foil around the ADCs to kind of contain the hot air or blasting it with a hot air wand. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and allow the preheater to first soak the board with heat, and then we're gonna rework and remove the existing ADCs and transplant those with two new ones straight out of the package. Here are some close-ups of when I had the ADCs removed and after soldering the new parts on, everything's nice and clean and we're ready to test. Okay, so we just finished replacing the ADCs. Now let's run the same sweep and see if we still get the same errors or if the errors have been resolved. Right now we're sweeping on channel two. It does appear, unfortunately, that the terrible readings are still there. So because of this, I'm inclined to believe that the problem is downstream of the ADC now, possibly the DSP processor itself. So we'll have to investigate further. So because our ADC replacement didn't work, I'm going to turn my attention now to the next part of what I believe the path is for the analog analyzer, and that is the DSP processor here. So now we'll turn our attention to what comes after the ADC, and in this case, that would be the DSP processor. In the U8903A, there are two of these ADSP21369 processors being used. They have a number of features, but the one that's most notable to me particularly is the fact that there is an optional read-only memory. Now, from a repair perspective, this would make things for us slightly difficult if analog devices were to actually be programming this ROM for Keysight. Let's say Keysight wrote some kind of custom code and they had it baked into this mask programmable ROM at the factory when analog actually made chips for them, then we would not be able to, of course, reprogram an off-the-shelf ADSP21369 because this is a factory-only option at the time of manufacturing. So as long as this ROM is not being utilized, then we should be able to do an outright replacement with a brand new part off the shelf and see if that makes any difference. So here's our rework setup. We've got our preheater again underneath the board and the foil around the part to kind of contain hot air as we reflow this. So we reflow the original part and remove it off of the board carefully not to rip any pads. And we clean and prep the area of the board that we just removed the part off of. After that, we get our new part ready. You can see that the package did change slightly, the uh, BGA package that they're actually using for the 21369, but it does appear to be an identical footprint, so we shouldn't have any problem soldering this on. So here we go, we get the new part soldered on and do a quick inspection from the side just to look at our solder balls, make sure we don't have any obvious bridging. Um, of course, BGA inspection is its own art form, but you know, we do the best we can with the tools we have and we can just really examine the part from the edges to make sure that we don't have any obvious problems with how it was reflowed. And this one looks good, so I think we're ready to go ahead and test. All right, let's give it a shot. Right now we're on the low bandwidth setting. And unfortunately you can see that there are still some crazy, terrible readings happening. They appear to be quite random. We can try this sweep again on the high bandwidth setting.
And we can see just like last time, uh, the results are even worse on the high bandwidth setting. Yep, so at this point, uh, you know, I believe the problem is probably in software or something digital that we haven't addressed yet. So let's take a look at the instrument and uh, hypothesize where else we could possibly attack from. So based on what we've seen so far, tracing the signal path to the ADCs, replacing the ADCs, and then replacing the first DSP processor, I'm becoming less and less convinced that the problem is in hardware, but it could rather be a software problem. Specifically, I believe that the problem could be in this flash memory in the actual DSP program that's being bootloaded on to the DSP processor when the instrument's running. Now, if we take a close look at these flash memories here, there's one for this ADSP and there's another one for the ADSP up here. We can see that these are custom marked flash ICs that are likely programmed before they're actually put onto the board. Now, I'm not sure that if, if these JTAG connectors provide any connectivity through the processor for this memory to be programmed after the part goes on, but I would imagine that this part is probably pre-programmed based on the markings that we're seeing. And we cannot really do anything about the program on here by doing firmware updates, for example, or trying to reinstall the application normally, because that really only affects the processor board. I don't believe that we are actually reprogramming the program that's being bootloaded onto the DSP processor themselves. So the only way I can really see uh, going ahead and trying to repair this instrument would be to get a donor. And I've done this on other instruments before, a working donor unit and copy the contents of the flash from the working donor unit and try to restore the non-working unit. So unless we have access to get these parts from another unit or the contents, you know, I could desolder this, put it in a memory programmer as long as I have the correct files. Unless we can get the contents that are supposed to be on here, the what I suspect uncorrupted contents versus probably something that's been corrupted on these memories, then I really don't see how we can move forward with this. Um, you know, so I think for now, I'm going to table this project and we'll call this part A on the repair because it's not complete. And at some point in the future, if we're able to gain access to either a donor unit or, you know, what do I have to lose by asking Keysight? If I can get these uh, pre-programmed memories from them, the worst I could say is no. So uh, I think, you know, right now we don't have the resources to complete this repair, but there are other avenues we can explore if they become available. So on that note, I'd like to conclude this repair attempt for now. And uh, if there are any updates in the future, I will be sure to share that with you all. Thanks for watching.